Monday morning! I am MPJ and you are watching Fun Fun Function. Normally I have a specific subject on this show, but today as you're watching this, I'm on vacation. So I'm mixing the format up a little bit. Uh, I just ask straight out of Twitter, ask me questions and I shall respond to them in the next episode. And that's what I'm doing now. Let's get right into it. Have you tried Swift? What do you think about this language? I've only briefly tried Swift, but I think a lot of it feels really good. It feels like Apple is taking a lot of cues from language developments that have happened in the last few years, and it feels like they have done a really nice pragmatic programming language um, that's modern and nice, and a lot of my colleagues around me speak highly of it. I also like the Swift Playground announcement at uh, WWDC, uh, where you have basically a scratch-like environment for the iPad, where kids can learn programming using Swift, uh, where you move a little character around. That's that's really nice. Now that Apple has open sourced it, it allows the language to uh, move outside the boundaries of iOS. I have a lot of people using it that uh, wants to start using it on the server side, for instance. I definitely think that it's a language that is here to stay. What is your complete workflow? Machine you run on, keyboard, top five tools you use for coding, organizing your life. I don't really have a static workflow. Uh, I used to, but I no longer do that. I, I, I try to be more focused on exactly what it is I need to get done and do that and not try to set up these elaborate tool chains or, uh, uh, or to-do list systems in order to like might make me more productive in the future. I used to do that a lot and I eventually started, found that I was doing that way more than actually working, uh, or at least I spent the time I spent off, uh, spent on it didn't pay off. So I, I basically stopped doing that. I don't do much to-do lists and, uh, and stuff like that. In the same way, I don't spend a lot of time customizing my, my tools. I just use a plain Atom. I don't install any plugins or stuff like that, maybe one or two, but really that's it. And I absolutely don't use tools to manage tools like uh, Yeoman and stuff like that. I think that stuff is just crazy. I elaborate a bit more on this in the uh, um, what editor do you use uh, episode. What is your opinion on ES7? What are the best and worst features? I have to Google this. ES7 feature. I don't pay a ton of attention uh, towards ES7 until it has been uh, ratified, but um, there are some things I like that I learned just now. You, that it's gonna have like this includes function on array, so you just call array includes value in order to check if a value is in the array. Uh, because right now, if you want to do this uh, natively in JavaScript, you just call index of. The value and check if that is not minus one and that just doesn't look as good and it doesn't uh, this is a lot more readable because it expresses the intent a lot clearer i like this improvement it just feels objectively better i also like that they are expanding the structuring into uh ob objects as well so that you can uh if you haven't seen my episode on this structure you can you can find find it there uh, uh, but uh, either way, you can like instead of using object assign, there's a really cool dot 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 operator that you can use to mix objects together. Uh, Redux uses it a lot. Uh, if you uh, are not familiar with Redux yet, uh, you're living your life wrong. You should check out Wes Boss tutorial here. Uh, a lot of people are excited about the uh, async await functions. It allows you to write some uh, asynchronous code, at least simple asynchronous code. As, uh, as if it was uh, synchronous. Uh, and uh, ah, I'm not too excited about it because I feel like promises, you have to use promises in order for this to work. And if you know promises, the, the cases where this can be used are pretty simple to follow anyway. So I don't know, I'm, um, I, I don't care too much. A lot of people excited about decorators, not super keen on decorators because I, they are a class feature and I don't like classes and I don't think that we should propagate classes that much in JavaScript, um, especially not like these Java features. Mm. I, it's my personal view. I um, Other people will disagree. I don't like them. Have you tried using Elm? 
Not a super interesting, but I don't pay too much mind, partly because it doesn't feel like it has a strong corporate backing or like a big organization backing it and pushing it and funding it. Uh, and I feel that it's necessary for me to even care. The ecosystem of a language is way more important than uh, the language itself. So in order for me to care about a language, it needs to have a like a sizable ecosystem or at least the potential of having a sizable ecosystem. And I feel like Elm is struggling there at the moment. I pay more attention to languages like uh, Swift and uh, and Rust because they have like they are both pretty interesting and good languages, and they have a very strong backing from the corporate uh, community. When you encounter a bug in a tool or framework that you use that blocks your workflow, what's your reaction? Do you try to fix it? For me, that's a very context sensitive question. Uh, I if I'm very focused on getting something done, like delivering a product at that moment, uh, getting that out the door, getting something shipped, then I will uh, probably just create a workaround. It's extremely rare that a bug in a, in a tool actually genuinely blocks you. You generally can just wrap something around it and work around it. On the other hand, if I'm in a situation where I'm people are a bit more calm, there's not a uh, imminent deadline looming, and you know, there's space. And if the library is something that we use a lot, and also anticipate using a lot for the foreseeable future, then it might be a good idea to uh, create a pull request into that repository and, uh, and try to get that in. It's often pretty fun as well to do that. Uh, it gets you out of your rut and your own products, and gets you interacting with other programmers. But it's rare. Uh, it's uh, it's a lot more time to get a fix into somebody else's code base than it is to get into your own code base. So, you know, it's it's a trade-off. I'd love to hear thoughts on algorithms and big O notation and the relevancy that it plays uh, within modern day web development. Big O. For you that don't know what big O notation is, uh, it's basically a way to write uh, like in, in a standard way uh, how how fast a function is or how many operations it performs uh, related to the stuff that it gets in. So for instance, let's say that we uh, uh, like it always does the same thing no matter what what it is that you put in. For instance, something that uh, gets in an array, and it uh, checks the length of the array and some other thing about the array and returns something. That means that it has a constant uh, uh, time complexity, and that is how you uh, you you express like this o one. It's constant. On the other hand, if your function goes through the array and does some operation on every item, that means that it would have n in time complexity n is the length of the array. So this is a fancy way of saying that the, the longer the array is, the more computer time it will take. But let's say that we have a, a function that goes through an array, and uh, uh, for uh, in every iteration, it also goes through the array again. So it's a, let's say it's, it's a for loop inside a for loop. Uh, that means that it will have n raised to the n in uh, time complexity. In some cases, this can be really important uh, in when dealing with, uh, with performance. Because let's say that this first case, where we just do a simple, f where there's just a for loop inside a, in a function, uh, and let's say if we, we plot this, like the more, so this line is going to represent how much uh, a juice it requires from your server farm. So if you get in a, uh, one item, a zero items, it does nothing. If you get in one item, it does some some stuff, and then as you get in more um, more data, it's going to do more uh, more operations. This is linear performance. This is linear performance because it, it plots like this. This, however, the uh, the example that has a for loop within the for loop, so the time complexity is uh, n raised to the n. This performance is exponential, and this is very dangerous because 
uh, when you get in uh, uh, zero items, it's going to do nothing. But when you get in one item, it's going to like only do one. But then it's going to do like two, and then four, and then uh, eight, and then it's going to like it's going to rate go more like this instead of this. So this curve is is exponential, while this is linear. If you have a server farm that looks like this, this is no problem at all because when you get more users, you can just throw more machines at it. It's gonna be a troublesome amount of machines at some point, but it's pretty manageable. In this case, however, you will not be able to throw more machines at your problem because uh, since this grows uh, at, like your performance problems grows at a much, much faster pace, uh, the more you items you put in, into it, uh, there is no chance in hell that you're going to be able to solve this problem by throwing more machines at it. So this is very important in some cases, uh, but there is a big hairy but here. This is important for scalability. And scalability is not, it's not the same thing as performance. It is just a field of performance. So if you're hiring a developer that uh, needs to deal with scalability, uh, and uh, like such a, a backend developer for your uh, uh, new startup, which you think will get like an, an enormous load over time, then you need to f have a person that knows these things in and out. However, if you're employing a front-end engineer, uh, like somebody is, that is going to write your uh, your interface, like scalability is not performance, and performance on the front-end is a very different beast. I don't think it's advisable to ask a front-end engineer about uh, big O notation because they might not have run into it. Because that is not the kind of performance consideration you run into in, in front-end development uh, normally. When you do in front-end development, you often deal with like tens of thousands of items, but you very rarely deal with billions of items yet that you might do on, uh, uh, on the back-end. On the front end, it's more important to uh, ask for questions like, uh, do they know what a flame graph is? Do they uh, do probing questions that see if they know how to use uh, the, the profiler and if they're experienced with the profiler? Ask them to talk about a performance problem that they uh, had in some application and, and how they solved it is often a good one that I use. Basically, when you're hiring a person and you think about performance, you need to have a person that knows how to reason about the performance of their field so that they are able to solve uh, performance problems as they occur. When working on huge amounts of data, such as you do when you do backend development, then Big O is, is very useful, but I don't think I've ever used it on the front end. In those cases, it's much more important that the person knows how to uh, take a uh, empirical approach and uh, use the profile. That's it for part one of this questions and answers vacation edition. You have just watched an episode of Fun Fun Function. I release this every Monday morning. This episode is a little bit different, but it's kind of like this. You should check out this channel below and some of the other videos and see if this channel is something that you might consider subscribing to. I am MPJ. Until next Monday morning, thank you.